Real Men of Real Estate with Steve Matley, construction manager and real estate developer, business owner and educator. Did you know that right now there's 22,000 units deficit? Tunde Ogunwale, real estate development professional, Naval Academy grad and veteran with a deep understanding of the public sector process. All of us want to live in thriving communities. Brian Fox, real estate expert and investor dedicated to helping hundreds of clients make money in real estate every year. There's so much housing going in. The builders are begging for more land. Future company can come in, lease up space to employ those people who are living in the homes. We have to put the housing in place. They either, either have to have houses, they want to make sure that there's a strong employment logistics center. Things like information hubs. We are a shipping economy now. There's economies all over the country where their prices are doubling and tripling. Hi, welcome everyone to Real Men of Real Estate. I am Brian Fox, your host for the day. I'm here as always with Stephen Matley and Tunde Ogunwale, wrapping up a series on adding value to real estate, where today we're going to focus on land, land development. How do you add value? How do you really make more on your investments when it comes to land? Our expert in this series is going to be Stephen Matley, and he's going to take us on a little ride of how to make the most of your land project. Steve, if you wouldn't mind, please help us understand what we can do to make land more valuable in our investment. Well, uh, first I wanna say is, um, you know, this is part four in a series on adding value. And we there were some commonalities between residential and commercial, like adding area and square footage. It's really difficult to add more area to land. It is what it is. You know, you, you don't, you don't so add on. You could buy the property next to it, but that didn't add value to that property. You, you, you basically bought more stuff. So with, the land, you have to look at what is its current use and what use could it be. That's your main thing you can do with it, is how can I make this worth more by increasing the usage? And there's two ways. One is you may not be able to increase the area of the land, but you can increase the number of parcels on the land. And that means I can take land that is currently zoned as one huge parcel or a collection of four or five smaller parcels, and I potentially can break those up depending what the zoning allows. I can break those up into much smaller spaces. So let's say even on a small scale, I bought a two acre parcel and I looked at the zoning and I said, you know what? There's half acre minimum sites available here. That means I could take that parcel of two acres and create four different parcels and have four different uh, places to build a home or whatever I wanna build on them or sell them to somebody else to build. And by doing that, I've dramatically increased the value. Now my company, of course, will buy one or two large parcels and turn them into 150, 200 new parcels. But that, that's on a little bit larger scale. So that's one thing you can do. The other is to actually change the use. And we talked about this a little bit in the commercial discussion. Changing the use means if it's currently zoned as agriculture or rural residential, can you change the use to a more higher density residential? Maybe instead of being uh, two or three per acre uh, home sites, now you can do uh, eight, 10, 15 homes per acre, depending upon what the allowance is in that jurisdiction and the zoning. Maybe you can change it from um, agricultural to residential or agricultural to commercial. You could change it from a residential to a commercial. You could change it from rural residential to um, commercial or residential or a mix thereof. And by doing that, you can add significant value to the land because now somebody else can come along and do something that they couldn't do previously on that land. Okay, fantastic. So in your model of the world, when it comes to land deals, um, the best way is either cut it up or add a little bit to it. But let me ask you a question. What out there is still available to do that kind of stuff with? I mean, because if we're in competition with a lot of other developers, builders, et cetera, how do we get in there, get a foothold and find one of these unique opportunities? It depends where you are. So if you, if you have the uh, wherewithal and the patience to work in the more urban areas, uh, here in Southern California, that's going to be San Diego County, Orange County, Los Angeles County, the western portions of, and the more populated western portions of San Bernardino, Riverside County. Uh, if, if you want to work in those areas, it's going to take a little longer and have uh, much more, I guess, obstacles to overcome. But you could buy an infill lot. And maybe you find that lot that is a, a one acre parcel in the city with an old house sitting on it. And then you can get that rezoned to for apartments. Maybe you get that rezoned for a mixed use project or some kind of a commercial use that you can do. Of course, in the 
outer areas, the suburban and semi-rural areas, you can buy a larger piece of land that may have been agricultural land at one time, and it's not being used right now, or even current agricultural use. You can buy that from the seller, and then you can entitle that for, say, a tract of homes, a shopping center, uh, or any mix thereof. So, Tunde, in your development of commercial stuff, how easy is it to find something and do that rezoning? How long would it take? How quick should we get a response for our added value? No, I'm laughing because when I met Steve, I was surprised because he's in and out a lot faster than we are on some of the big block industrial. And I was like, darn it, you got me. Um, and so in, in terms of your first, the first part of your question, I think it's relatively easy to see opportunities. The challenge is dur during due diligence on land and commercial you're spending a lot of time on due diligence to try to figure out what 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 what's blighted on this property what is, what where, where are some of the flaws before you get in you know what what are some of the issues that you need to take on from an engineering standpoint from a political standpoint etc but there are a lot of sites that are available by talking to brokers or just driving around in some of the communities that Steve mentioned. You can find sites to underwrite and evaluate. Uh, in terms of timelines, uh, it, it really does depend on what the existing use is when you're coming to a site. We'll use the example that Steve had in terms of rural residential. If you're trying to go rural residential to industrial, the product type that I like, light industrial, I would say that on the fastest end, on a relatively small site, you're looking at 24 months. And then it could be five years, seven years, 10 years, depending on where you're at, because there could be a lot of constituents who need to be uh, comfortable with the plan, with the parcelization, and with the new zoning re and requirements. I think that's more on the kind of the industrial side. And I think, Steve, you probably see sites where the entitlements are a little faster than what I've described. Well, faster, and I've seen much slower. So, for example, the closer you get to the urban areas and the closer you get to the water, in Southern California or most cities, the longer it's going to take. Uh, projects that are close to the shoreline in Southern California in the urban counties, uh, those can take over 10 years, 10, 12, 14 years to get approvals or longer. You've got Coastal Commission approvals, you've got all kinds of environmental concerns going on. Um, even in inland from that, there's a major housing project up off the 15 freeway in North San Diego County. Uh, that was about a 12 year approval process to get that project put uh, approved. Now, I, we work in jurisdictions where we intentionally select jurisdictions where it can be faster because there's, there's very, very limited uh, environmental impact in those areas. They're very pro-growth. They like the development fees that come from growth and they actually need the population to grow their commercial base because uh, that has to come first. Uh, rooftops will eventually equal retail and commercial, which is where the tax dollars come from for those cities. And, and so in those areas we can usually get through in anywhere from 12 to 24 months. 24 months would be the long end where on Tundays those would be the short projects. Um, we can get through in 12 to 18 months on a lot of our projects by working in those jurisdictions. Now, and there's a lot of keys to that. Um, one, don't get bite off more than you can chew. A, a very large project is going to end up becoming a specific plan with an EIR attached, and that's going to take a long time. You Sorry, for definition purposes, EIR is? An environmental impact report. Very cool. Okay, very so, so in California, and, and every, every place across the country has these rules, like NEPA is the national loop. That's the National Environmental Protection Act that allows public input into what a private property owner can do with their property. Okay, and then in California, and that's not overly arduous anymore. It was more arduous before, it's, it's actually been simplified. In California, though, we live in the land of CEQA. That is the California Environmental Quality Act. And in California, of course, we love big government and we love bureaucracy and we love layers and layers and layers and obstacles and red tape. And so we create a lot of that for ourselves. And that means a lot of people have a lot of say over what you can do with your private property. And that is that public hearing process. So you have two things. You have the CEQA process, which is everybody and their grandma gets to tell you what you can and can't do with your property. They get a say in it. And on the other hand, you have the subdivision map act. If you're doing residential that, basically lays the map out if you follow that and do what it says, you cannot be refused. However, each individual jurisdiction can determine how long the process will take and which obstacles you have to jump over to get there. And a lot of it's gonna depend upon their appetite for growth, what, the, what not only that the city as an agency thinks as a government entity, but also what the city as a community of individual citizens think. Uh, those sometimes don't match. Uh, so you, you have to be cautious with those. 
Steve's highlighting something, and I, I do want to kind of tie it back to the value add because part of part of this discussion, I think, some people would ask, well, why would you go through this extended? <laughs> right? I mean, you might be thinking that a little bit, but one of the things that I think kind of comes to mind, and it really speaks to that value add. Right now, you put money in the bank, you might get one percent, maybe. Bank. And then if you invest in some type of bond or debt, you might get four or five, depending on a municipal bond or whatever, four, five, seven percent. Maybe you're lucky if you, you touch 10, that's doing great. And if you're smart enough and you've got the right resources and you're on the flip side of predatory lending or credit cards, you might be able to get low double digits, 10 percent, 11 percent, 12 percent. You could find distressed notes or something like that, get 11 percent, 15 percent or whatever. When you start looking at the value adds that Steve's describing on the, the land value add, you're looking in the 20s, 30s on the very low end if things don't go very well. 30s, 40s, 50s, 80s. I think mm -hmm. you've got a deal where you're triple digits. We've got, yes, so, high 60s, low 70s, annualized, okay, so otherwise. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's give... That's <laughs> part of the reason why. I just wanted to kind of tie that in. I apologize. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you're good. So, and I actually, I want to make this a little more quantitative for everybody. I have a million dollars and I'm going to do a land deal. What is my 20, 30, 40% return look like over 12, 24 months? So they really box this in. Okay, well, first of all, let's let's look at it a more simple because most people yeah. don't uh, we're listening here aren't going to have a million dollars or four million dollars split in. But let's say they go into a syndicated deal. Okay. And let's say they come in with um, you know, let's say they 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 come in with 25 grand. Okay. Okay. There's, there's a lot, that's a lot of our investors come up with that amount. And then they come they take it through their they bring it in through their self-directed IRA account or whatever they got. Okay. So, or they're just their funds. And so they come in with, with 25 grand. Now, if you're getting around a 70% annualized return on a project that goes 18 to 20 months, because remember annualized return is different than straight return. Mm -hmm. If you're getting 70% annualized, you're getting significantly more than that on a straight return because you're right. right. longer. You're probably, you're getting your $25,000 back and then you're getting a check for about 27 or 28 on top of it. So you're more than doubling your money in about 18 months, but it's about 70 something percent annualized return when you factor right. it out. So that's the kind of money you're making. And, and that same 25,000 put into say a residential fix and flip would be a down payment probably. Maybe. Plus, plus you've got to then yeah. get a fix, a rehab loan and you've got to qualify for the mortgage. And then right. that rehab loan is probably a hard money loan at high interest. And then your clock is ticking on you. It's like having that taxi meter running on you the whole time. And then you got to go to Home Depot and buy all the garbage and all that kind of stuff, right? And, and do the work and then sell it and hope you don't get stuck and hope the COVID pandemic doesn't, doesn't knock you out right when you're ready to sell the thing, right? Because <laughs> you can't show it to anybody. And so, so this is, and, and you're lucky. And then if you can make, as Sunday said, 8, 10, 12%, you're dancing on the street. You think that's a wonderful return. And it's a lot of work. Uh, so that, that's, where, that's why people will do the land. Um, it's interesting when you do just the land, it doesn't look any different from the day you buy it just to the day you sell it if you're just doing the entitlement part. But it, it significantly increases. Now, if you really want to add a lot more value to it and you don't mind sinking a lot of money into it to make that happen, this is more like on the, what we talked about in our commercial discussion, you can do the grading and infrastructure improvements on the land. You can take that land that you've now got entitled and put in the utilities and the streets and the curbs and the gutters and the flood control and all the stuff. And, and now you've got you can sell all those individual lots off either separately or as a block, whether it's commercial or whether it's residential. It's just, then, to, just to make it very clear for everyone, when you talked about the value add on the land, uh, the value add on land, it's mostly drawings. So it's paper, it's yeah. drawings, and it's a political process, right? You're going to meetings. It's, and it's a lot of time. It's a lot of time and a lot of meetings and a lot of responses and a lot of correspondence. And you're right. And civil engineering plans. Yeah. Right, so it's, there's not a lot of physical work that's being done. It's drawing work, there's brain damage because you're talking to people, you gotta get them to all line up, but, there's, but it's mostly a paper and political process. And you can get your ego bruised if you go into a public hearing and you get beat up a little bit. And, and that's happened, but, it, but again, if you pick the right jurisdiction, that's not gonna happen for right. most, most cases. If you, if you want the really high returns, you're going into contentious situations in the more urban areas where the dollar values are higher and you're doing much larger projects. In that case, you, you run the risk of uh, having a public sentiment that doesn't necessarily align with what you want to do sometimes. And, and then you're in for a little bit of a, of a battle. But again, if you follow the rules, they really can't refuse you if you're following their general plan and their rules and, and dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's. But that doesn't stop people from trying to stop it and, and delaying it. 
and, and you touched on the minimum investment. So I work on deals where I couldn't contribute to them because they're multi-million dollar institutional gap. The minimum investment is, is $200 million, yes. <laughs> exactly. So, so for you, the, the land value add that you're talking about, the minimum investment is what, twenty five. For us, it's about 25000 on most of our projects. It changes project to project. Um, but there again, that's because we, are, we intentionally designed them to allow the non-professional developer to participate in these kind of projects because generally it's out of their realm. They can't touch it. It's a barrier, it's a barrier to entry, honestly. Who's got, you know, a few hundred thousand or even a few million sitting in their mattress? They don't have that. Right. So, no, but well, rarely, rarely. Rarely, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> unless they develop the great they did the greatest app and it went like fire. But you know, for the most part, for the for the mere mortals among us, you know, yeah. that's um, they can probably come up with ten, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars to invest in something if they have a good retirement account and their good savings. And, and, and for people who are learning about this, because land value add isn't something that always comes to mind as an investment opportunity. What? How, how do you think the market looks? How does it look for finding those types of opportunities now? Well, there again, it's what what are you what are you creating the land for? If I'm developing land for urban office buildings, I wouldn't do that right now because I'm seeing that as a dinosaur. It's starting to go extinct a little bit, right? Um, on the other hand, um, if, if, if I'm doing land and I'm for in, industrial projects like e-tailers and uh, distribution centers in the Western Inland Empire of Southern California or in some of the other um, just outside the growth areas of cities like Houston, um, cities like Atlanta, uh, cities like um, potentially Las Vegas, uh, growth cities. Um, you could you could do very well on that. And of course, when there is in Southern California a housing shortage, and you can provide entitled land for a builder to provide affordable entry level single family homes, which is the golden unicorn of real estate in California. It's it's you can't find it. That has a lot of value to it right now, and that demand has not shrunk. It's actually grown. Uh, and the values have actually gone up. So I see that as, I'm very bullish on that right now, as we talked about in some previous episodes. So. Very good. Well, that was intense. I don't even know where to start. I think I might go to land instead of residential. <laughs> so was there. But uh, as always, uh, this has been a great conversation between us, Tunde, Steve, myself. Uh, this has been on land and how to add value. And you hopefully got a much better look into the world of land. I know that it's kind of an auspicious item and most people disregard it because fix and flips are so easy, but as you can see, there's a tremendous return. Uh, as always, right here on The Real Men of Real Estate, we're happy to have you. Thanks for joining the conversation. You can find us on Roku and on our website, realmenofrealestate.com. As always, we continue conversations on real estate and how you can benefit from the world around us. If you need anything from us, please email us directly. Ask to be a part of the conversation. We're happy to have you. And as always, have a great day.